Good evening, everyone. I'm Judy DeWinter, Chair of the Royal Free Charity, and I would like to warmly welcome you all to our RFC Presents event this evening. This event is part of a series of talks hosted by the Royal Free Charity that feature speakers who are leading the pioneering work that the Royal Free London is known for, from cutting edge research to clinical innovations. These events are part of a deep partnership between the Royal Free London and the Royal Free Charity, and together we develop and support high impact projects in our hospitals. The Royal Free Charity is helping patients today, supporting staff at all levels, investing in the infrastructure of our hospitals, helping to make care safer, more efficient, more effective and closer to home. And we help patients tomorrow by funding life-saving and life-changing research aimed at finding cures and new treatments for diseases like diabetes, amyloidosis, haemophilia and cancer. The generosity of the charity's donors and enthusiasm of our volunteers enables us to help the Royal Free London to go beyond the limitations of NHS funding so that we meet our joint clinical and research ambitions faster. Many of you watching today will have supported the Royal Free Charity through giving time, money or advocacy and I want to take this opportunity to thank you all. It's only with your support that this works possible. Before I introduce you to our guest speaker, I'd like to mention a few administrative points. There's going to be a Q&A session later after you've heard from our guest speaker. And those of you that are on Zoom can type questions into the Q&A box and you can do that throughout her talk and then we'll aim to answer as many questions as time permits. We're also recording this event and we'll be posting it on our RFC Presents YouTube channel where you're also gonna be able to find recordings of earlier events that you may have missed. With us this evening, we have Dr. Chris Strether, who's the Chief Medical Officer and the Deputy Chief Exec of the Royal Free London. And Chris is also a Royal Free Charity Trustee. And he's going to be chairing the Q&A session later. So he'll have the chance to introduce himself um, to you then. I'm delighted to now introduce our guest speaker, Professor Derelyn Hughes. Derelyn is Clinical Director of Research and Innovation at the Royal Free London and Co-Clinical Director of the North Central London Cancer Alliance. She has a particular focus on blood and lysosomal storage disorders and rare genetic disorders for which she's regarded an international expert. Derling's going to be speaking about clinical research at the Royal Free and she's going to explain why clinical research is an essential component of any healthcare strategy. I know from my own personal experience, the huge importance of clinical trials, which progress and translate ideas that lead to improved treatment and improved outcomes. The, innov the innovative treatments that are available to us today are as a direct result of patients who have come before us who have participated in clinical trials that have provided the evidence needed for us to access these treatments. It's been a challenging year for everyone and tonight's talk is a reminder of the necessity to keep innovating and there's no better way to do that than to hear about the pioneer pioneering work at the Royal Free London and how it's helping patients. So over to you Derelyn. Thanks, Judy. Hello, everybody. It's really lovely to be with you this evening, albeit virtually, to talk about clinical research and to explain why I believe clinical research is so important to improving health and health care. Now, I'm just going to show my screen. I hope you can all see that. So I've called my talk from bench to bedside and back again, the virtuous circle of clinical research. And I'm going to explain during the talk what that virtuous circle is. Clinical research is how we develop new treatments and knowledge for better health and better health care. It might be thought that clinical research is actually a recent innovation However, credit for the first clinical trial actually goes back to 1753. A lot of you will recall from high school that the use of citrus fruit of oranges and limes in the treatment of scurvy was first discovered on the ships in the 18th century. But what you might not know is that this was in the original clinical trial. James Lynn took a group of 12 sailors and he divided them up into six groups of two giving each group of two a different acid. So some got vinegar, some got dilute sulfuric acid, and some of them got a mixture of oranges and lemons. 
after six days, only those which had received the citrus fruits had recovered from the scurvy. Now, sadly, the fruit had run out at that time. And maybe that's a future metaphor for some of our resources. But in fact, those sailors were well enough then to look after their colleagues for the rest of the journey. A well-controlled clinical trial in which they were able to make some uh, conclusions about the effectiveness of oranges and lemons. You would have thought that this would have been rapidly adapted into healthcare and into the Navy. However, it took another 40 years for that to become a mainstream intervention and for the Navy to mandate that citrus fruit should be carried on ships. One of the themes that I'm going to pick up today is why some of the best science fails in its translation into healthcare. There are, however, many benefits of clinical research beyond that, which is obvious about improving knowledge and about improving healthcare interventions. There's research in over 200,000 patients with colon cancer, looking at the outcomes of those patients in terms of their recovery from their operations and their long-term survival. Depending whether they had their surgery in hospitals where research was performed or hospitals where there was no research. The outcome was better in those patients who had their interventions in the research hospitals, regardless of whether they took part in a clinical trial, speaking to the overall benefit that clinical research has on the sort of healthcare that we give. And there's been numerous other studies finding the same theme of improved healthcare, such that now research leadership and research implementation is part of the CQC questioning for the well-led domain. There's lots of other reasons why research and clinical research is so important in healthcare. It brings benefits in terms of wealth generation and the economy, in the close monitoring and support of patients, in changes to individual and group behaviour, and importantly, in the sense of well-being and sense of contribution to the healthcare of our patients now and in the future of our clinicians. And that's certainly a theme that I've encountered when I've been talking to people, to our clinicians and to our patients in my new role as Clinical Director of Research and Development. So my title mentions the virtuous circle of bench to bedside of translational research. And I want to explain what that is and why it's so important in that implementation of healthcare innovation. Most research starts in the laboratory with clinical scientists, scientists looking, trying to understand what causes disease and what possible interventions might be. It often starts as a bit of a fishing expedition. Can we possibly find out everything that we could about this condition? However, ultimately, out of that comes a possibility of intervening and making something better, either a new drug or a new intervention. And at that point, that intervention goes into preclinical research. This is usually a model of the disease, sometimes an animal model, sometimes a mathematical model, a computer simulation, but it goes into preclinical research and testing. If it proves itself in that phase, then it will go into phase one safety studies where we look to see if we can prove the safety of the intervention. And that's often in healthy volunteers, although sometimes it can be in patients. Passing through that phase, we then go into early phase studies, looking at both the safety and the effectiveness of the intervention in patients. And that's often performed in clinical research facilities in hospitals like ours. Once the drug or intervention is approved, then we look for it to be implemented. And that's where it's really important that those clinicians who are involved in the implementation of the new drug actually ask questions. They make observations. And it's vital then that that circle, that cycle is actually repeated and the questions go back to the laboratory. And I would argue that probably the best clinical research and the greatest clinical benefit comes when the original questions come from the clinical observations, when they're derived from our work with patients and from questions that patients and clinicians looking after them raise. 
I want to give you a couple of examples of how great translational work has arisen at the Royal Free. Lucy Walker heads up our uh, group within the Institute of Immunologists who are looking at the impact of immunology on diabetes. She's discovered the immune cell which triggers type 1 diabetes where the body actually starts to act, act against itself and break down the cells which make insulin, thereby causing the diabetes. Great bench work, great laboratory work. But she's now taken that into looking to see whether those cells are sensitive to new forms of immunotherapy. And then when that immunotherapy is given to patients, whether they respond to it and whether that then can predict their overall response to the treatment. So from the bench in her laboratory into the clinic to the benefit of patients with diabetes. Another example of that translational work arising in laboratories at the Royal Free is the work of Tim Mayer, one of our oncologists. He's also one of our research leads. And he's looking to see whether by analysing single cells, individual cells from the blood of patients with cancer, he can tell us about the prognosis and the treatment responses of those patients, thereby providing a guide to what sort of treatments those patients should have. And that's a really easy procedure taking blood from a patient compared to biopsies and so on. It's important translational work arising in the role free. However, despite the masses of creative science internationally, very little of it actually comes to reap patient benefit. There are thousands of different disorders. And despite that, there's only 500 conditions which actually have drugs which are approved from them. Much of that science gets lost in translation. And this has come to be known as the valley of death. And I think one of the reasons is because the interventions, because the things which should be considered in the laboratory, don't actually have any relevance to human health. Because the questions have not come from patients or come from hospitals. Sometimes it's because there's a lack of resource and lack of finance to move them forward or other blocks to that. But I believe that one way of bridging that valley of death or bridging that link from laboratory science into hospital science and benefit from patients is by allowing the clinicians to ask the questions and by linking together the laboratory teams with the clinical research teams. So following through on clinical science into the laboratory. Serendipity or chance or the chance observation isn't sufficient. And this is an example from, from my history where I, I studied. Many people would know that Alexandra Fleming discovered penicillin and actually it's been put down to a serendipitous discovery back in 1928. Or perhaps a sloppy scientist, the story goes, doesn't it? That he left his Petri dishes on the side while going on holiday and when he came back, he saw that there was a, a death of the bacteria around uh, some of the, uh, the cultures there, and that was penicillin. In fact, I, I fact was probably far from the case, and Fleming had been working on antimicrobials for many years. So it was careful study. But what he in fact wasn't able to do was to take that observation into clinical practice. He wasn't able to purify the penicillin and to find a way of using it. And that fell to Howard Florey and the research team in Oxford. Florey, Chain uh, and Ernest Heatley purified penicillin and then tried to intervene in patients who were septic. The first patient you might have heard about was a policeman who'd become septic. It's often said by pricking his, uh, his finger on a rosebush. I think that's apocryphal and it was actually uh, something that had happened during the Blitz. But he was in hospital in the John Radcliffe and he received those first doses of penicillin. He actually recovered, but in fact, the penicillin ran out. Florrie and his wife, who was a pharmacist at the John Radcliffe in, in Oxford, tried to purify the, uh, the penicillin from his urine. They fed it back to him, but it still wasn't enough. And sadly, Albert Alexander, that first patient, passed away. Flory then went on to uh, try to do uh, similar studies in children who required lower doses. 
but it required the initiative and the impotence to carry through on that initial observation and actually do the studies to reap patient benefit. And I think it's a testament to that, that not only, that only four years later, penicillin was being used in the raw free. And this is a picture of Albert's dispensary. Albert was a porter in the raw free back in 1945. And he was responsible for distributing some of the pharmacological agents that were being used. I mean, hard to imagine now. But in fact, back in 1945, penicillin was being used. It was stored in the mortuary because it needed cold storage. But a great example of rapid implementation based on clinical science. But for real patient focused clinical science, I think we need really good clinical questions and those need to come from clinical teams. Is he, uh, uh, sorry. So um, Nobel uh, prize winning ph uh, physicist Isidore Rabe said that it was his mother that in fact turned him into a scientist. And whereas the other mothers at the end of the day had all asked, what did you do today? What did you learn today? His mother had asked him, so what question is he did you ask today? What question did you ask? And turned him into a scientist by his ability to ask questions. So there's a large amount of lab work, which in fact turns out to have no clinical relevance because the right questions haven't been asked. And people with labs often don't have the contacts with the clinical uh, side of the work with the patients. And so I think one of our roles in the hospitals is actually to make those connections with the laboratory teams in order to be able to implement laboratory science and enable the good questions to be asked that benefit patients. I'm gonna give you some examples of some of the great questions that have been asked by the Royal Free Research teams that have left, led, um, led to really tangible benefit for role free patients. Gaucher disease is a rare inherited metabolic condition. It's more common in Ashkenazi Jews than in many of the other uh, population. And at role free we have a very large population of patients with Gaucher disease. Some years ago it was noted that there was a higher incidence of Parkinson's disease in patients with Gaucher than in the general population not only in patients, but also in their relatives, people who were carrying the gene for Gaucher disease. So Professor Tony Shapira, who's one of our neurologists, started to work on the relationship between some of the molecules involved in Gaucher, the enzyme glucoserebrosidase, which is deficient, and some of the molecules which accumulate, with the molecule synuclein, which accumulates in Parkinson's disease. And this led to increased understanding of the relationship between these two conditions, which led on to a study where we can try to detect the early occurrence of Parkinson's disease in patients who are carriers for Gaucher disease. And furthermore, the possibility to treat Parkinson's by using a drug that's originally been looked at for Gaucher disease. So by asking that question, what is the link between these two disorders? We find a way of further predicting whether patients might have one of the conditions, but also a potential for treatment. Similarly, really great and detailed understanding of the patient population with kidney stones by Shabir Muchala, one of our renal physicians, has led to the development of a research programme, which is absolutely pioneering at the Royal Free. He has five interventional studies, all looking at improving the outcomes for patients with kidney stones. He's the first fully electronic renal clinic performing over the last year, and the first patient in one of the most important uh, clinical trials of kidney stones. But not only that, he's actually using our clinical practice group methodology to try to spread that innovation, to bring it into detailed clinical practice. And then we have the really amazing work of Swampna Mondal and the obstructive sleep apnea team. Swampna's looked at the causes of obstructive sleep apnea and understanding how that relates to our population. She's looked at the old way that this was managed and treated within the community and with her team has developed a new way of managing the condition. It's shorter, it costs less, it has better outcomes for patients, 
and better experience for patients. And it's been recognised by the BMJ as an award. So a really great example of by, by asking the right question has led to patient uh, benefit. And I can't leave this area without talking about COVID-19 related research. As you know, um, we've had many patients with COVID-19 related symptoms, including pneumonia in the hospital over the last 12 months. One of the early observations was that patients with COVID-19 pneumonia had better outcomes if they were turned to lie prone, to turn to lie on their faces for some hours a day. And whilst this is a really simple intervention, actually it requires a lot of hard work and literal heavy lifting from teams of usually surgeons turning the patients on the front, turning them back again every few hours. So Colin Beard, who's pictured here demonstrating, and Vishal Nanglia, got together and asked what could we do to make this better for our patients and for our teams. And they formed a really great collaboration with the National Physical Laboratory and actually with Foster's Architects. And with funding from the Royal Free Charity, they've managed to create a new intervention, a proning board, which protects patients from some of the problems of proning, some of the problems with pressure around their eyes and their faces, and makes it so much easier for the teams who were doing the proning. Because they made that original clinical uh, observation and work through it in that collaborative way. Maintaining a relentless patient focus not only allows us to ask the right questions, but also to design better studies. These are some comments made by our uh, patients about research at the Royal Free. And they're all very uh, complimentary about how good it is to be part in research. But by listening to some of those observations and questions at research, we can do research better. We can always design the per theoretically perfect study. So we can have the perfect entry criteria. We can have the perfect outcome measures. We might make it so perfect that it's actually impossible to recruit patients to it, or so perfect that it's too difficult for any patients to participate in. So by maintaining that relentless patient focus and asking the right questions of patients, can you do this? Is this actually likely to make benefit? Helps us to design those studies. There's good evidence that that allow, enables the studies to go more quickly, to recruit better and to give better results. Involving patients in our study designs also allows us to avoid assumptions. Many assumptions made on the basis of little uh, information. And so it's important that we challenge those. There was a, a series of meetings back in the 90s to look at outcome measures for rheumatoid arthritis affecting the joints. And a set of outcome measures were um, proposed by a series of experts who said, this is what we should be looking at in all our clinical trials. It took 10 years to bring patients into that group at which point the patient said, but you're missing all of these outcomes that are really important to us. So it would have been really important to bring patients into that discussion early on. It's also important that we follow through on those assumptions and those questions with good quality clinical research. It would be easy to make the assumption that giving people who are deficient in something like albumin the albumin back would lead to a better outcome. But really excellent quality work by Louise China and the liver team at the Royal Free has shown that that's actually not the case. That by infusing albumin back into patients with liver failure isn't necessarily going to give them a better outcome. So important to follow through on those assumptions. One assumption is that simple can't possibly be helpful. This was challenged by some work on a vitamin called Atra uh, back in the 80s. This is uh, the pictures show acute promyelocytic leukemia. It's a sort of leukemia where patients get horrible bleeding and often die very early on from bleeding problems. But a group of Chinese workers were working on a very simple intervention. They were just culturing the cells with vitamin A. And that seemed to reverse the ability of the cells to be leukemic cells. They stopped being leukemia. It was unheard of and nobody believed it. 
Nobody believed it until the work was repeated by a French group, which for reasons of probably our own Western bias, challenged that assumption. And actually now ATRA is part of our mainstay treatment for acute promyelocytic leukemia. You might suggest that a similar situation occurred when people started to suggest that a similar intervention like dexamethasone, a simple steroid might be beneficial for COVID-19 pneumonia and COVID outcomes in patients. And in fact, the absolutely phenomenal recruitment of our teams at the Royal Free has contributed to proving that dexamethasone is valuable for the treatment of COVID-19 a really very simple intervention that has come to benefit through an important but very large recruiting clinical study. We've had over 350 patients recruited into the recovery study looking at dexamethasone from Barnet. And in fact, a simple intervention vaccination, well, maybe not so simple, but more than 600 patients recruited into vaccine studies at the Royal Free. Those are studies of very large numbers of patients and we've had the opportunity to do that, sadly, because of the current situation with COVID-19. Clinical research has moved on incredibly quickly, but it's very unusual for that to happen. But small iterative changes over many years can add up to major benefits. And the graph here shows the improvement in outcomes in leukemia over years, over decades in the UK. And the rule free has been part of many of these studies. The lowest blue line shows that back in the 70s, the chance of survival for leukemia was about 20%. But you can see by enrolling almost every patient in the UK into clinical trials of leukemia year on year, decade on decade, the line has gone up. Slow, iterative gains adding up to no more than 60% likelihood of survival for patients with acute myeloid leukemia. And this is the sort of work which we have the opportunity to participate in at the Royal Free, bringing our laboratory work into areas of benefit where there are very large numbers of patients, for example, some of our cancer patient populations. The flip side of those large patient populations is our work in rare diseases. William Bateson is probably the father of genetics in the UK. He brought the work of Mendel to English speaking populations and really pretty much ruled biological sciences in the decade or so after Darwin. In his inaugural lecture back in 1908, he said, treasure your exceptions, keep them always uncovered and in sight, treasure your exceptions, treasure your rare diseases. Rare diseases are individually rare, I mean, that's obvious, but they account for about one in 17 people having a rare condition. And the Rule Free is a global leader for many rare diseases. We have global leadership and research going on, as Judy mentioned in her introduction, in amyloid, in haemophilia, in lysosomal storage disorders, in lots of other areas. And we're well placed to actually conduct research and to bring benefit. If you have small numbers of patients in small areas, it's very hard to actually describe the condition to bring in the laboratory work to ask the right questions. So by bringing those patients together under the Royal Free roof, we're able to conduct high quality research. This is work of uh, Professor Danny Gale and Keith Gomez in the Haemophilia Centre, and they've contributed enormously to the work of the NIHR Bioresource for Rare Diseases whereby many thousands of patients have contributed their DNA for sequencing to understand the underlying mechanisms of rare diseases, bringing about potential for interventions. Danny gave me this slide with this moving molecule on here. And this is a molecule that's been discovered in a condition which is very rare. It's a, a rare renal disease found in Cyprus. By his work on the genomic sequencing in rare renal diseases, the underlying cause of this kidney disease has been found and the possibility of a new medicine discovered. And similarly, Keith's work in very rare conditions and haemophilia, where there's sometimes no more than 100 families in the world, has brought together the potential for bringing new and often simple interventions. That leads to a great possibility for teamwork and interorganisational cooperation. 
And one focus of this has been the new Welcome Centre for Interventional Surgical Sciences, where some of our surgeons have been going to actually work together with scientists and physicists from other areas, providing new surgical devices, which are more precise, less invasive and more safe for patients uh, having procedures. So really important, bringing together people from different areas to do that work. And crossing the paradigms and the biases, which currently blinker us, and sometimes mean that we don't ask the right questions or we don't have those fresh thoughts. I was recently very privileged to talk to Professor Robert Fosbury, or Bob. Bob's an astrophysicist and he worked for many years with the European Space Agency and was responsible in part for putting Hubble into the sky and all the data that came off Hubble over many years. He retired about a decade ago and with an insatiable appetite for knowledge and for learning and research, started to look around the internet and started to read about some of the things that were going on in UCL. And he came across this question, why do reindeers have blue eyes in winter? And in fact, I didn't, I didn't know that, but reindeer have a little membrane that comes across their eyes, which is blue. And Bob said, I knew instantly because he's dealt all of his life with light in the atmosphere. And he knows that in winter in the tundra, the light goes blue. We can't see it, but the reindeer can. Blue light's actually very damaging. And so they have little filters, blue filters that come across to protect them from blue light. So Bob spent the last 10 years now working with more fields and the eye doctors there to understand the impact of blue light on human eyes and ways of protecting us from that. And how important is that with a year on Zoom ex, um, exposing our eyes to blue light? And they're all free. We have a really important history that we can build on. We have got a fantastic legacy to build on of research. Dame Sheila Sherlock was the first female um, professor of medicine in the UK and professor of uh, liver uh, hepatology at the Royal Free. She built an, a department looking into liver and liver failure and has created an environment for liver research, which is ongoing even today. Victor Hofbrand was a professor in the Department of Hematology for 24 years. I can see Judy smiling on my little camera here. I mean, she knows Victor. And even after Victor retired in the 90s, he's been around, he's still around, even now. Creating an enormous legacy for haematology, not just in the Royal Free, but in, in the UK. He brought to us oral collation for iron for people with thalassemia who have iron overload, meaning that they don't have to have injections to collate the iron, they can take tablets. But even more than that, during his 24 years as a professor of haematology at the Royal Free, he trained hundreds of haematologists of whom at least 28 of them are professors in their own right and leading their own haematology departments and research. So, um, something little flashing on my screen. So Sheila Sherlock was one of the first people who understood and observed the relationship between hepatitis B and with uh, liver cancer. That work goes on today. William Rosenberg is working on the relationship between hepatitis C and liver cancer. He's brought treatment to those patients, curing over 3,000 people, reducing deaths from liver failure, halving the incidence of liver cancer and reducing the need for transplantation. His team have also worked on an algorithm which helps GPs understand whether patients should be referred to hospital. That's reduced unnecessary referrals to hospital by about 80%, and saving hundreds of thousands of pounds for the local health economy. The work in the liver unit goes on in trying to understand the problems and opportunities that patients with liver disease bring. There's a shortage of organs, a shortage of organs for transplantation, and there are deaths related to liver failure. So Rajiv Shalan and the liver failure team are looking at new ways of intervening in those patients with patient orientated questions. And Jörg Pollock here uh, in his Scrubs for Theatre is working with other members of the team to look at artificial ways of creating livers and to preserve livers, looking at organ failure 
an organ regeneration is a really great question to take forward into the future. The haemophilia team are also building on that legacy of haematology at the Royal Free. Back in 1984, Ted Tudnam, who was a haematologist at the Royal Free and is also still around, cloned and synthesized for the first time factor VIII. That's the blood clotting component, which is deficient in people with haemophilia, so they bleed. And now 40 years later, he's assisting and supporting Amit Nathwana and Pratima Chowdhury in bringing gene therapy to patients with haemophilia B and I'm sure haemophilia A. Gene therapy where patients, instead of having to inject themselves two or three times a week and having bleeding problems, have a one-off infusion of a virus containing the DNA for the haemophilia gene and are cured then uh, for life. Some things haven't changed very much. On the left is the lab from 1959. Uh, you can see lots of bottles and boxes. And on the right is our lab from last week. And again, there's quite a few bottles uh, and boxes there. And um, you can see there uh, my two PhD students. Some things have changed about the way that they're funded. Back in 1959, the funding was mainly from the hospital and the total of research funding at that time was £20,000. Whereas now in 2021, most of our funding comes externally. David's funded through the Royal Free, um, so David's funded through the uh, British Council and Lucia's funded uh, actually from the Royal Free Charity to do work in Fabry disease. Some things might have changed. Royal Free started to emit uh, women as medical students back in 1871. And this is the class from 1886. This is the class of 2008. And I, I don't think any of the uh, 1886 ones are still around there. But I think some things have changed a little bit. And we look forward to the uh, latest iteration, uh, maybe for our anniversary of, the, uh, of this picture. Some things have clearly changed, and this is now building our infrastructure for the future. This is where haemophilia started at the Royal Free back in 1966, a Catherine Dormandy's caravan parked outside of the hospital. And this now we look forward to the opening of the PERS building, that collaboration between the charity, between UCL and the hospital, to bring to fruition the clinical research translational science, a true um, collaboration for bench to bedside medicine. So our future is building on that expertise on the facilities and the collaborations. We're so proud that Mark Liddell's lifetime of work in tissue regeneration and gene therapy has come now to the uh, most recent announcement only last week that Raw Free in collaboration with King's and UCL have been awarded the MRC status as a gene therapy hub. It's got enormous potential for patients, for developing clinical materials and facilities, and for the expertise required to progress gene therapy that you've heard about into clinical trials. Our future is building technology. You can see here some of the new cardiac imaging technology. That's a picture of a heart, would you believe it, on the left. And on the right, a picture of a tiny coronary vessel. Building on that technology through imaging, so that here we can see even down to a cellular level, pictures of amyloid overlying the original cells. And building on data is part of our future. This is uh, work of Mariana Fontana in the cardiology department, taking data from all of our many systems to create algorithms for artificial intelligence in order to be able to improve the diagnosis of patients with cardiac amyloid and no doubt other diseases. And most importantly, building our future, our people and our patients. These are just some of our teams. It's not possible to show all of them. This is our cardiology, our liver and our renal team and our lung uh, team from Barnet. Building our people so we have the expertise, so we have our teaching of people about research and so that people have time to do research. And building up our patient population, enabling them to participate in research. So as I come to the end, I just want to um, thank you all for listening, but to thank all of my colleagues who've contributed their work to the Royal Freeze uh, research endeavours, but to, to this talk, 
It's all of their brilliant work and any errors in oversimplification are all, all mine. Um, there are many more examples. It's, it's too short a talk to be able to go through them all, but I think um, there is just amazing research work going on with our uh, teams at the Royal Free. And I'd love to answer any questions that you have. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Darren. That was just fantastic. I'm Chris Trevor. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and Deputy Chief Exec. And I'm just going to host some questions with, um, for uh, Darren for 10 minutes or so before some closing remarks from Judy. Um, Darren, that's fantastic. It was erudite. It was broad ranging, uh, very informative and brought in, you know, stuff about history and then the stuff we're doing particularly here. I've got, I've got a first question for you, which um, Philippa came up with, which is, and given your focus on being patient-centred, um, seems important, which is how, how do we get patients to help us co-create uh, research and help us pose research questions? Uh, I, I, that's such an important question because we know it makes such a difference to um, how we do research and how important the research is. So um, I think it is about, I mean, we talk to our patients, that's what clinicians do. So asking them questions both informally, but also building up panels of patients who are happy to give us feedback, to understand the sort of problems that we're facing and give us guidance on that. Um, we do have a, a patient partners group and we have some patient groups building up through the charity and through the R&D department, but we'd really love more people to be involved in that. Thanks, 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 Terrell. Um, I've got uh, we've got a whole rash of questions come through, so I'll try and try and get some reasonably quickly. Um, so, so the um, first one is: if we talk about the charity's help with the proning solution, are we exporting that to other hospitals? Um, so we are exporting it in the sense that we've um, our team were really keen that this should be made freely available and as on open access, open science. So it has all been uh, put out there openly and we've deliberately sent it all to UCH also to try out. So we'd be delighted for other people to uh, have those designs and, and work through them. Thanks, Darren. And another one, which is which is kind of slightly related to this, which is um, is, a, a, is from James Mountville. This, thank you for the you know for the fascinating talk. But it's also saying, um, how, how do we get how do we get this out effectively to every patient? And could you say something a bit about health services or improvement research and the disciplines which underpin those? And what are we doing about that that kind of you know in, in improvement science at the Royal Free? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think getting it out to every patient is about embedding clinical research in our normal everyday activities. So in our recruitment of patients, in our data science, in our clinical pathway design, clinical research from an R&D perspective is about bringing that new knowledge and new devices and interventions but it's a blurred margin in some ways with what James is talking about, which is clinical improvement. And actually quite a few of the examples that I gave you are part of, of clinical improvement science. So I see innovation as not just being um, the ethically approved uh, R&D governed research, but it's also about clinical practice groups, about uh, quality improvement and about how we um, we define the problems, we think about solutions, and then we measure them and keep going back through that cycle. Thanks, Taryn. Um, and another quite short, um, quite short question was: um, it's really good to see the um, the pairs building, you know, just just about done. Um, so there's a question about: will the opening of the pairs building help bring clinicians closer to research? Yeah, I, I really hope so. And I think it's it's about getting all of the clinicians in the hospital and all of the scientists who work in the labs, in the pairs and in the institutes, all freely mixing together and asking questions, crossing the paradigms and uh, understanding what each other does. And I think, I mean, it's not just clinicians, it's other people in the hospital. I think it's really important that our operational teams also understand research 
their roles in it and the value that it gives. So I think the PERS building will do that. There's, we had a session with patients on Friday to think about the benefits and they were just overwhelmed by the fact the cafe on the ground floor will be open to the public and they'll be able to come in and ask questions and understand yeah. about research. That's really important, thanks. Um, and then as a, you, you brought in digital about two thirds of the way through. So a question from Amit Bakai asking about um, um, the future of digital pathway innovations and can we join that up to clinical research? Yeah. So I, I think one of the absolute strengths of the Royal Free is digital research. Some of this is part of, of that formal clinical research, but other, others of it will take a, a different form under uh, uh, digital research innovation. And I think it needs to be some ways brought together and in other ways we should em empower our uh, researchers with data and abilities to mine that data and bring it back for patient benefit. I think it's such an important area. Thanks. Thanks. And then an interesting question from Bimbi Fernando. He said the funding for research is extremely competitive, um, which is correct, but how do we ensure that cooperation is maintained in a very competitive environment? So that's, a, that's a, the interesting answer to this. Yeah. So um, I think uh, competition for funding is one of the things that is actually quite divisive and we we tend to hunker down and keep ourselves together uh, because we know that people down the road might be doing something similar whereas in fact collaborating even on the proposal to get the money is likely to be we're more likely to get the money and we're more likely to get a great answer to the research problem so um, I think it is important that we collaborate and we keep on talking and COVID has broken down a lot of those barriers and I, I'd like to see a lot of the things that we've learned in that in that area go forward um, in terms of collaboration and working together. Thanks, thanks Jeremy. The next two questions are both from governors. The first from Sneha Bedi, who's our new lead governor, so w welcome. Um, and she says, what are the challenges you faced um, to keep researchers motivated? Because there are inevitably some failures whilst trying to find a treatment. How do you keep people's spirits up? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I find is that is most compelling, actually, when I talk to research is the joy that they have in doing research because they see it as a way of improving things. So things don't work sometimes. You, you're quite right. And um, I think it's important that we allow people to fail in research, that we allow people to go for the big grant and it not to happen or to try something. And as long as it's properly governed, if it doesn't work, that's a valid outcome. And we say, that's OK. We move on to the next thing. It's, it can be quite difficult in people doing lab science because when something doesn't work, for them, that can be the end of the world. Uh, psychologically they you know very upset when something doesn't work whereas actually for the clinicians they're looking after the patients and that brings rewards in itself yeah and i think it's, that's that's tough that's tough isn't it and i think one of the things that I, i'm james asked an earlier question would say about improvement is actually you know a failure rate is desirable you know you, you have you have to have a failure rate to to be fresh and keep innovating but it is quite difficult to maintain spirits while that happens um so that um the next question for goes from peter zinkin which is is there a conflict in the rate of adoption between open source publication rather than finding a partner with resources to um, promulgate the work um but not for free so is there a conflict between those two two sorts of um uh dissemination of research Yes, I, th I think there, there are conflicts and our teams often want to, to do things completely for free and openly for the benefit of all mankind. And I absolutely understand that. It comes a bit back to the penicillin al analogy. When Flory went off, he was so determined to produce more penicillin for the benefit of mankind as he gave all the rights over to the big American drug companies. They made gallons of the stuff, but they also made billions of dollars. Actually, when Norman Heatley started to look at streptomycin and those drugs, he was a bit more canny and he held on to the IP rights. And, and that's probably done more for research in the future by keeping some money within academia. So I think there's always two sides to the argument. So I'm, I'm, we've not got much time left, so I'm going to link the next two questions together. So apologies to to Amy Bakai and Katie Morrison, whose questions I'm going to link. But the, the Amy's is about... Um, there are divides in research participation 
um, by ethnicity, both in researchers and in part and in you know subjects. Um, so how are we going to address that? And then Katie's asked, you showed the 2008 picture and the, it, there were rather more men in the 2008 picture than women, weren't there? So, so what, 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 what are we going to do about, about promoting diversity in research? Because we'll get richer research if, we, if both participants and researchers are, are more diverse, won't we? Yes, absolutely. I mean, they're really good questions. And in fact, a recent uh, Royal College of Physicians survey uh, absolutely called out the lack of diversity both in uh, in patient participants and in in uh, researchers so I think it's about education from um, from for researchers of all areas and it's not just about about doctors doing research it's about having more PIs in other um, related disciplines having nurses as PIs having our um, OTs and physios and therapists who make great researchers also contributing and about proactively going out and not allowing research to be the domain of just a few who hang on to it because they know it's of, of either particular interest or benefit to them but bringing in equality across the whole of the the piece uh for research i totally agree about the pictures i um i was going to say actually you no know, to the 2022 picture i think um if we do it today it would be much more diverse than even 12 years ago but there is something about keeping that going That's, yeah let's um let's work on that and I think one of the other things, and Darren will be too modest to say this, but we've got some fantastic role models at the Royal Free. I mean, I think part of our history about um, having women at medical school first was was part of that. We've got some fantastic role models, and we've already heard in this series from Emma Morris, and we've heard from Daryl, and we're about to hear in a future meeting from Margaret Johnson. So we have got some role models, which is a which is a good which is a good start. I, it's we're very nearly at times up. So there's just a final question from Jenny Cross. Um, so Jenny, thanks you for the talk. She says, how do we maintain enthusiasm and achieve research answers whilst delivering the rigour that's required to do it properly? So that's the kind of rigour enthusiasm balance. Yeah. Again, really great question. I think it's, um, it's giving people the time that they need to have the rigour and giving them the support so they understand it. So if somebody has no time and are trying to do things in the evenings and weekends and they have a 60 page ethics form to do, they're very quickly going to lose enthusiasm to do that. If we give people the appropriate time and we have a really and we have a fantastic R&D team, but our R&D team are able there and also have the time to help them do it, then they'll be able to get through all of that that element and actually um, then continue on the fun bit which is doing the research. Okay thanks very much Darren and I'm going to hand you over to um, Judy for some closing words but thanks very much that was just magnificent thank you. Thank you Chris um, and thank you Darren. Um I think I speak for everyone when I say that your talk was absolutely fascinating and insightful so many good examples of the historical great work at the Royal Free, as well as what's going on now and um, ambitions for the future. And certainly from the charity perspective, we look forward to working with you and your colleagues to advance your work even further. And um, thank you also to Chris um, for chairing the Q&A session and for joining us this evening. Um, and finally, a huge thank you to all of you for watching and for taking the time to listen and to ask such good questions. Um, hopefully you'll have learned more about our work and uh, the work of the Trust the ambitions going forward. Um, we look forward to welcoming you, as Chris said, our next event um, is going to be with Professor Margaret Johnson. It's on the 26th of April. April. Um, and Margaret Johnson, amongst other things, set up the first and the largest open access HIV testing clinic in the UK at the Royal Free. And also, interestingly, she was consulted by the researchers and producers of the recent series, It's a Sin. For many of you um, who would have watched it, you'll recognize uh, it was a fantastic series, um, and I'm sure, she, I'm sure she'll be talking about um, her involvement in that, and we might even get uh, one or two of the characters to, to come along, or the, the, the actual people behind the characters. Um, but before I go, I just also want to say that after these events, people often ask us how they can support us at the charity. Um, and I think, if I'm right, on the screen any moment, you're going to be um, seeing how you can how you can contact us if you want any more information, if you want to support us, 
Um, and it's also got on the screen information about um, the next few events that are coming up, the RFC presents events. But for now, I just want to say thank you for joining us again and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.